thank everyone for being here. I'll quickly introduce to our today's co-moderators. Um, first, we have uh, Toba Bender. Uh, her research focuses on gender relations and social networks in Renaissance era Florence, but her teaching covers many aspects of medieval and early modern European history. She joined FIU's department in 2012. She is a permanent instructor focused on undergraduate serving the undergraduate chair. She was a 2017 recipient of the Faculty Senate Excellence Education Award. And Heather Blatt is Associate Professor of English Literature. She taught here at FIU since 2011. Her research focuses on issues related to textuality and book history in mid late medieval England. She teaches classes ranging from medieval monstrosity to the global Middle Ages. Her first book, Participatory Reading in Late Medieval England, is forthcoming this spring. Thank you both for being here. So the subject of white supremacy in the fields of medieval and early modern studies has been an increasingly fraught topic in the past year in particular, as it's been coming to our attention as specialists in medieval studies that a lot of white supremacists have begun, begun or have continued but stepped up the co-optation of medieval symbolism and imagery and slogans for the purposes of promoting white nationalism and white supremacy. This is intersected with some challenges that medieval studies face more generally in terms of race and racism uh, in the practice of medieval studies. And so it's become an increasingly pressing issue. And Dr. Gitter and I have individually and, and together talked about how we've tried to address this in our classes and in our research. So we thought we would um, start the conversation today by talking about some of these ways that we are seeing medieval imagery in the hands of white nationalists and white supremacists and talk about then um, what that means for us as, as scholars in medieval studies. So I'm not sure I think we've got some examples. So these are images that come from um, the um, demonstrations or riots, depending on what time period, at Charlottesville okay. uh, last summer. Um, and what you see here are white nationalists, white supremacists holding a shield um, with an image. And it's the image uh, that is associated with um, the early medieval or late Roman saint, St. Uh, Marcus. Um, and uh, he was a Roman soldier who was um, killed for his faith, um, according to the legend. Um, and his this image of sort of fighting for one's faith, right, and standing up, who, right, um, has been co-opted by white supremacists. This image in particular is really ironic because the saint in question is almost always depicted in art as black, as a sub-Saharan African. Um, he was, in fact, from Egypt, so it was quite likely that, historically speaking, he was black. Um, but that doesn't, that seems to have gotten lost here, right? Um, if we move forward, right, all of these um, penance, um, sort of medieval heraldic um, imagery you see being used by white supremacists. Some of these are imaginary images. Some of these are images that have been redesigned. Some of them, like the image of um, St. Marcus, have just been, completely taken out of their historical significance that's been ripped away and they've been adopted. Um, and again, another image here with the sort of shields and heraldic symbolism. Um, white supremacists like to imagine the Middle Ages as a time when Europe was all white and all Christian and um, argue that as an all white and all Christian time period, it produced wonderful cultural things. Um, the problem is that it was never all white and all Christian, um, and that wonderful things were produced many times as a result of intercultural contact. So one of the questions we as medievalists are dealing with is how do we correct the image about the Middle Ages? How do we take back Middle Ages say to white supremacists, white nationalists, no, you can't use this. this. This is not to be used this way. And this is incorrect. Um, 
So what are our responsibilities? What can we do to get there? Um, and um, how? how? How do we engage in this? Um, questions facing us these days. Um, because we were planning on sort of leading a discussion. Um, so I guess let's start off by um, stating or asking you guys, um, right, we in academia present a version of history. Um, this the version of history that's being presented by white supremacists is clearly not the version we're presenting. So what do we have a responsibility here? Do we have a responsibility as historians and do we have a responsibility as citizens? Um, and sort of how far does that responsibility go? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And one of the, there's actually a term for what you're describing, and it's medievalism, right? And medievalism is basically the imagining of the Middle Ages, right? If you guys want an example of medievalism, Game of Thrones, right? Um, Assassin's Creed, right? Uh, Renaissance fairs, as you mentioned, right? These are imaginings of the Middle Ages. Um, they're not actually real medieval history, but medieval history and sort of fantasy um, been intertwined, and this is a long, long history going back to, of course, uh, Tolkien, um, if not further, um, who was himself a professional medievalist, right? But not from telling us, of course, represents the Middle Ages, right? Either. Right. So that it has been imagined this way, you're right, is really problematic, and I think you're right to point, for example, movies and um, Renaissance fairs. Um, and one of the things that's been coming up more and more as these discussions have been happening is uh, why aren't there more characters of color? Why aren't there more um, diverse characters in movies, in video games, in representation? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Ja. You've really hit the nail on the head there. Yes. Do you want to dive in? Sure. And I think you highlighted something that's also really powerful in terms of what anybody can do, which is not just the extra research, but also think about critiquing the spaces that you inhabit professionally and academically and think about how diverse is this space? Is it representing things that I think are worth representation? And if not, how can I correct that? And this is something we don't often talk about. But many academic departments, not just medieval studies and medieval scholars alone, are interested in these issues and often value feedback from students. And you can, in many cases, reach out to somebody like the director for undergraduate studies and say, hey, I'm really interested in a history curriculum that expands beyond these understandings. Or I'm really interested in an, uh, an English literature curriculum that situates more centrally the voices of people of color. Um, so that's something that you can do uh, even when it hasn't yet made its way into a classroom situation. Uh, and I'd like to encourage all of you to think about it because it's quite effective pressure very often when that pressure comes from outside. Um, and in fact, a lot of the ways that medieval studies have begun rethinking how it's teaching and how it's producing scholarship has become, has developed because of external pressure from people who are just casually interested in the Middle Ages, but want to see the faces of more people of color discussed and talked about. For example, the Tumblr blog, Medieval POC, um, has been deeply influential. And it's a completely, um, it, it's, it was a um, Tumblr that uh, an undergrad, I think, an undergrad mm -hmm. history major. I'd love to bring it up. Yeah. Sure. Who has no professional connection in the academy to medieval studies, but was interested in the subject even after concluding their undergraduate studies and just started this up because they wanted to see the representation in a way that hadn't been addressed in their classes. So that's something that I think you raised that's really powerful that we can also critique from the position of being students as well as um, from the position of being instructors and scholars that's worth keeping in mind. Mm -hmm. This one? Uh, that, uh, it's, it's a problem. Right. Um, and the goal of this website um, basically is to say, hey, like, let's change the way we're literally looking at the Middle Ages, right? Let's not just depict white faces, white people, male faces, right? Um, let's act so not a recreation, but the honest of the images that were produced in the Middle Ages that are much more diverse than the ones we're selecting out, right? So it's putting those images back in, those original images. And it's really interesting that um, it was, if I recall correctly, it was the uh, medieval POC Tumblr um, mm -hmm. creator who was one of the first people who stepped up when the image um, that Dr. Bender showed earlier of the... Um, I keep wanting to call this a hawk, but it's it's an eagle. Eagle, so yes. Um, started to circulate and pointed out that hey, not only is this being misrepresented, but the saint with whom it's often affiliated is traditionally represented as black. And it was the medieval POC Tumblr um, creator who was the person who stepped up and, and noticed that and stated it and shared that around initially too. So it's a really great example of somebody who. Um, from a kind of what we would consider an amateur outside of the academy status is the one who is kind of highlighting some of these issues. Uh, and I think something else that's worth keeping in mind, too, is the way certain assumptions about race get kind of baked in unquestionably uh, into medievalism. So as Dr. Bender mentioned earlier, Game of Thrones is a great example. Um, there are tons of fantasy series, of course, that are also medievalism, and, and Tolkien's um, books and the recent movies based on them have been another major influence. And one of the things that they do that's both completely inaccurate and consequently enormously problematic is the way that Tolkien imagined race, which was hugely influential in fantasy, in the fantasy genre. 
So Tolkien imagines race in a um, particular way that you probably have noticed all along, but not necessarily thought about, um, which is if you think about Tolkien, you think about dwarves. What are some of the things dwarves are known for? Short, drunk, mm -hmm. what else? <laughs> yeah. Love eating, absolutely. What are some other qualities of dwarves? Aggressive, absolutely. Other ideas? Smith, right. So notice that there are all these qualities that do belong to dwarves because they're dwarves. That asserts that there is racial um, skills. So skills become racialized. Interests become racialized. Preferences and moral attitudes are represented as belonging to dwarves for no other reason than they're dwarves. If I asked you to do the same for elves, you would come up with a huge new list of different qualities that belong to elves only because they're elves. That's kind of a deeply problematic attitude towards racism that Tolkien kind of unquestionably laid out and the fantasy genre just picked up and ran with. Um, and so sometimes that gets, without even noticing, you end up consuming media, media um, that perpetuates these problematic ideas about racism by suggesting that people possess certain qualities purely because of biological characteristics that they gain from conception and birth. Um, and so noticing when you're um, watching media that does that and pointing that out can also be really um, powerful ways of critiquing that kind of problematic representation. And not just thinking, oh, well, this is because it's fantasy. It's fantasy, but it's shaping how we often think about or perceive or accept or, or shape the ideas we accept without thinking about them. Right. Yeah, and I mean, part of that, too, goes back to the idea of what we're getting about the Middle Ages, um, if you're not signing up for a college talk on it, is largely from popular media. Right. Um, uh, when we talk about it, you know, I know I right now, and thank you for this, Josh, actually, I'm going to, right. I haven't yet um, really caught up on Assassin's Creed, but I'm hearing all of these things from my students. And like, I need to figure out Assassin's Creed because my students are coming into my classes with all these ideas about Assassin's Creed. And I'm like, well, what do you, like, I don't, I don't know. Right? But that's where you guys are coming from unfairly because it's the only exposure you've had, right? Um, but I think this also goes back to the point of the um, woman behind you, which was a really good point, and that we have this, we call it in, in history or in academia, the canon, right? And the canon, right, is what is taught. Now, as you can imagine, the canon is mostly dead white men, right? Um, Think about the books you read in high school, right? Think about the history you were taught. Um, this is the canon. Now, we've made efforts to sort of adjust the canon, but mostly that's been like, let's fit in one of these or one of those, right? It's not really blowing the canon out. Let's add one woman. Right. Let's add one minority. And right. But only an elite white woman. Yeah. Um, so we, as, his, as scholars, as medieval studies academics, are thinking, okay, we need to rewrite this. How do we rewrite this, right? How do I teach the Middle Ages without starting at Beowulf and going through to the Hundred Years War between England and France? Um, so this is something we're actively thinking about, and we're really, as a discipline, struggling with this right now. Not struggling like, oh my gosh, we don't want to do this. Struggling in a good way. How do we? How do we do this in a way? that works well to teach, that makes logical sense, 
but that isn't the canon. Right. So one of the things I'm trying in my class this semester, and I've been very open with my students about this, is we're going to do a whole heck of a lot more of Spain in my medieval survey class. Why haven't, why, Spain isn't part of the canon of Europe. Why isn't it? It's smack right there below France, right? It's, it's part of Europe. Well, because it was Muslim controlled, right? So it has just dropped from the canon. Well, that doesn't make any sense. So I'm trying to be more inclusive that way. Does this solve the problem? Of course not, right? But it's a step forward, right? Um, I hope. And, you know, then we'll do more and more of that. And, you know, I know Dr. Blatt has taken a lot of different approaches, too, um, that are also about how do we change the canon. And this is challenging not only in terms of the canon, but it's also challenging in terms of disciplinary training that mm -hmm. still holds sway in our departments and our disciplines in that if you decide to pursue graduate education in, in English literature, you're going to be taught English literature. If you decide to pursue graduate education in history, at some point you're going to be invited to specialize in a particular country or a particular period of time. And that means that as you specialize, and that specialization is necessary for how our programs are developed and our training is crafted, um, that specialization means that you might not know a lot of things that happen outside your region and language and area and time period of specialization. And this also presents so my training is in um, medieval English literature, and much more specifically, as I indicated in my in the introduction, my training is in medieval English textuality, particularly late Middle English textuality. I specialize in about a hundred years of the thousand-year period of the Middle Ages in one country and one language. Um, and so the challenge for me and for many of my colleagues in our desires to re-envision what our courses could be is that we're often fumbling our way to finding texts that we don't even know existed. They're out there, but they belong to a different discipline. And so we've got to kind of network and we've got to do all this other reading and it can feel fairly uncomfortable at times, not because we don't want to do it, but because in the case of English literature, for example, there's not only literary studies, there's comparative literature studies. That's a completely different discipline than English literary studies. So by introducing things to my, into my classes, which I'm striving to do and have done and will continue to do, that fall outside the realm of medieval English literature, I'm moving into the direction of comparative literary studies that I don't know much about. And so in order to do that effectively and do that well, I'm having to re-educate myself. And that takes time on top of the course design and everything, which is why some of these changes can seem like they're happening very slowly in terms of course redesign. Because in order to do it well, we've got to, we've got to come up with the time on top of our other professional expectations to learn something about a different discipline in order to teach these texts effectively or teach them creatively. And, and so it's something that I know a lot of people have not that has not stopped people from doing it. But it also means that even as we know that this is an urgent need, it can take time for us to implement. And so we're also looking at ways, what can we do in the meantime? How can we bring different conversations together to kind of address these issues while our fields are trying to catch up to where we've already decided to move in the direction of? Right. We want to just not do it. We want to do it well. Yeah. Right, and to teach a text you've never done about a culture you don't know much about and you want to do it, the pressure so high to do it respectfully and to do it accurately. And that, you know, is important work. Um, mm -hmm. But that's why there's a lot of things. Other questions? Oh, and then I will clear the video. Yeah.
Yeah. One of the prominent medievalists in this discussion who really pushed on the rest of us to diversify our teaching um, has said, um, let me see if I get this right, um, basically that the Middle Ages has become a weapon. And we are the arms dealers. And it's no longer okay to say, oh, well, I just teach it, and however people use it, it's how they use it, or, you know, they can access it if they want to, as you're saying, right, which isn't really true. We need to think about this. And she says, if we are not teaching an explicitly anti-racist curriculum, we are teaching a curriculum that can be used for racist purposes. And that's a real wake-up call, you know, and I think an important one, as you said. And one of the things that we need to do better is get off our bums in our offices and reach out, right? Blogs, tumblers, things like that, and put the information out there. And then... Do you want to take this one? Sure. I think that there, I mean, there's so many different reasons that are all kind of worth um, further consideration in your own life. Um, it, it, just even in terms of the founding of the United States, notions of the Middle Ages were quite powerful. Um, Thomas Jefferson, of course, one of the writers of the Declaration of Independence and a founding figure for the University of Virginia, was very much caught up in the idea of an Anglo-Saxon ethnicity that he wanted to see promoted. And that gets kind of structured into the curriculum of the University of Virginia. You see kind of ideas about the Middle Ages becoming part of the culture of the American South with the notion of kind of chivalric behavior in the 19th and, and 17th centuries. Uh, and then more currently, there are a couple of different phenomena that I think are both very interesting. Of course, there's the fantasy genre and Tolkien's place in it and the kind of massive popularity of that. Um, and then there's also um, the notion of warrior culture and the appeal of warrior culture. You might have even gone to a movie theater in the past five or six years and seen a trailer for the Marines advocating enrolling in the Marines by talking about the kind of warrior you can become. And that's bringing an idea from the Middle Ages and kind of the warrior culture that's popularly represented in the, of the, about the Middle Ages into the modern era um, and into our present moment. And then we do some kind of reverse work, too, which is that the middle, the middle medieval period becomes a popular dumping ground for ideas that we don't want to believe belong to us. So you might think about how many times have you heard of torture, contemporary torture, referred to as medieval how many times have you heard of rape referred to as medieval misbehavior, right? How many times have you ISIS. heard, right, ISIS um, countries get, we treat certain countries as if they're so backwards, they're medieval. Um, so the Middle Ages becomes a place where we dislocate and displace things that we don't want to believe are modern. And that allows us in some places to escape confronting the fact that these are actually part of modernity, part of our contemporary and present moment. And so that's another reason that I think it holds so much sway. It allows us to um, take things we don't like about ourselves and pretend that they don't belong to us by suggesting that they're medieval. And that continues to kind of promote this, um, a different set of ideas about the Middle Ages as well. Mm -hmm. 
um, we often come across the term dark ages, and that's strongly tied into um, this kind of progressive of a medieval period, too. Uh, no, I want to, Josh had his hand up a while ago. Yes. Sorry. Did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. These are all such great comments. Um, so I think, right, I think you both have really valid points here. You all do, right, in the terms, this comes down to critical thinking, as Angela said, that, um, but access, right, absolutely, right. And I think, if I may, um, one of the things I was hearing from you is, yeah, the information's out there, but it's hard to find, right? So it's not necessarily that us as scholars can't find it. It's that it's scary that when you look up a certain topic, right, the first 10 things that come up are inaccurate, um, you know, not just necessarily inaccurate, but downright um, scarily, right, misleading. Um, and yes, a good scholar goes past that, absolutely. But what about your 10-year-old? Right. What about, you know, the average person on the street? What about the person without access to a university library, which costs a buttload in tuition? Right. Um, yes, we try to train critical thinkers. And that, to me, is one of the most important parts of my job. But it takes some serious work to do. Right. And that's the point you guys are both getting at. Right. You have to be intellectually energetic to put in this kind of find accurate information and you also it costs money and there's gatekeeping um, absolutely um, so I think that's a really important point um, and I also like the point you brought up about um, right like little kids when they're getting them right um, when you do middle ages day in elementary school or whatever right because we don't actually teach it maybe there's a day right it's all these images that are not historically accurate so how do we how do we counter that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Dr. Blatt weigh in for a second, and then we'll come back. Yeah. So like the point that you raised about access, which is something just to kind of um, contextualize that, increasingly of uh, concern to scholars in the academy and particularly in the humanities. If you've ever paid to download an article, for example, not a penny of that goes to the scholar who wrote it. Not a penny. That's because our research is um, published for free 
we get little to no money for publishing because our research is being paid for by the universities that employ us. This is becoming increasingly recognized as a problem in that secondary distributors of the research that we've already been paid for are charging premiums for access to it. And so just kind of more broadly, there are movements in the academy of people who are interested in trying to take down some of those walls to access um, and recognize the fact that if we want to distribute an article that we publish or a book that we publish in a digital form, there are some, should be ways that we should be able to do that, that other people can access them without, without having to pay a premium, that you should be able to access that even if you're not currently enrolled in a university, um, or that your university library privileges they should continue with you after you graduate. That's not always the case. Often you graduate and within a month or so you lose access to your library um, privileges. Or you might have borrowing privileges, but you can only access the electronic resources if you come on site. So there are people who are, uh, and different programs and, and um, groups that are trying to kind of change these because we do recognize that it's problematic. And another way that um, other people are trying to address this situation is by putting increasing weight on um, public scholarship. Uh, so the medieval peer Steve Tumblr is an, a good example of public scholarship, somebody who took a degree and an interest and created a resource that is freely available to people. Another really good resource is the public medievalist, um, which is a collective of people who are not formally employed in, in, by any academy, by any university or college, but want to, again, kind of take what they've learned and take their training and promote it to people so that when you do Google something, something like from the uh, archives of the public, uh, the public medievalist becomes one of the first things that you see rather than one of the last things that you see. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that is, um, at the same time that we want to do it, it's also one of those situations where we have to kind of work to change the culture of universities. Um, because scholars like ourselves are also trying to think about what ways can we take what we've learned and what we know and what we work in and work with and create a kind of public space for discussing those. And then that runs afoul, unfortunately, sometimes a promotion issues. Public scholarship is not credited when we go up for promotion. It's not credited when we're considered for merit bonuses or anything like that. And that's something that we've got to also work to change the culture of to say that this is, because it's public, it is valuable. It is not something worth ignoring. And that itself is something we're trying to kind of address and, and even as we continue to struggle with that acknowledgement now. Okay. Did we address your comment about critical thinking? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question, and it's certainly something um, I've done a lot of thinking about. I know we both have, but in terms of teaching um, Gordon Rule with writing courses, for example, um, right, on the one hand, um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, there's all these viewpoints, all these viewpoints are equally valid, and mm, I'm not sure they are, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are many viewpoints that are valid, but not all of them, right? And just to take right, a really glaring example is, right, sort of the view that, you know, um, medieval Europe was a haven of white Christian culture, right? You could have that viewpoint, but that is not, in fact, a valid viewpoint in my classroom. Um, and where it comes down to for me and what I try, try, try to teach in my classes, um, both at the lower level and the upper level, is we need evidence, right? Um, an opinion is not grounded in evidence. Um, an argument is grounded in evidence. And you must be able to produce evidence. You must be able to address counter evidence. You must have less counter evidence than you do evidence, right? So to me, as a historian, when I teach one of the history, like my UH 2021 that some of you guys are enrolled in, honestly, for me, what I want you to leave the classroom with is the knowledge of the Middle Ages is here. The ability to critical think and to express yourself in writing is here, right? Because to me, that's a tool that is useful all over the place, right? 
So I give you documents. I want you to create an argument using that evidence. And that to me is just the most valuable skill that I hope, whether you're a history major or an engineering major or a science major or whatever, that's what you leave my class with. But it's hard in this era of, you know, post-truth or, or whatever, right? Both sides are equally valid, but not always, right? <laughs> Did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think that um, one of the other ways that I think about this, and, and my uh, mm -hmm. approach is in many ways parallel that of Dr. Bender's, where I might set the topic of the course, I might set the readings, I might set the questions, at least where we start, not necessarily where we end up. Um, but the skills that I'm teaching above and beyond the topic are what I really hope will develop or further everybody's critical thinking skills as they come in and out of my classes. And part of what I strive to do is, is often um, articulate the different processes that contribute to critical thinking so that even if you um, didn't necessarily find a particular day's topic that interesting, you're still contributing to the development of those skills in some way. Um, and then something that I've also done, and I've had some arguments with colleagues about this, uh, is that I no longer, I no longer treat my classes as spaces for discussing every single permutation of every single idea in that um, I teach about medieval monstrosity, which is a subject that you cannot study, um, whether you study monstrosity in the Middle Ages or after the Middle Ages, without encountering issues like misogyny, um, without encountering issues like racism, and without encountering issues like homophobia, when Islamophobia. Uh, and I am not going to set up conversations in my classrooms that allow some members of my class to invalidate other members of my mm -hmm. class. I'm not going to promote a conversation, for example, about what do you think about misogyny? I don't really care um, in the sense that I don't want to have a conversation about somebody who's going to say, well, I think that men and women have certain innate differences, and this is why men are better at leadership. I'm not interested in fostering a conversation where half of the class gets de de invalidated um, because somebody is struggling to work through their thinking about misogyny. Um, and so... I still am pushing towards critical thinking, and I haven't stopped that. But I've also started considering much more explicitly um, what kinds of conversations I'm going to foster in the classroom and make sure that those conversations, at least without any, um, do not without any intentionality on my part, foster discussions that end up devaluing somebody else in the classroom. And that's that can be tricky to handle because maybe somebody would really benefit from having a frank discussion countered by their classmates about why misogyny is really problematic. But if that person needs that benefit, it's going to have to happen somewhere else because there are consequences for that. There are stakes for that for everybody else in the classroom. And that's partly also the kind of tricky balance I'm trying to strive to achieve at times. Um, okay, I saw that hand in the next. Yeah, I think um, public history, which is what we call this documentaries, museums, oh, things like that, public scholarship, at its best inspires people to do their own research and to do their own critical thinking. Uh, you know, at its worst, it can present misrepresentations, right? And that's certainly a problem, too. Um, so that it can go both ways, but it's, it's out there, certainly, and it's something that we as, historic, as scholars need to address. I want to let Josh yeah. know.
Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 That's a really great question. Um, is it the lack of evidence? And the answer to that is unequivocally no, it's not a lack of evidence. We have plenty of evidence. And that's where that medieval people of color blog is really, really important. It's saying, like, we're not making this up. We're not writing in people of color. We're not imagining them in. These are images from the time period, and here are people of color in them, right? And this is important, right? I think this goes back in many ways to the idea of the canon, right? Where um, images, uh, texts written by people of color or about people of color or about intercultural contact have largely been de-emphasized in favor of texts that do not deal with those. And in part, that was a very uh, calculated political decision back, you know, as Dr. Blatt was talking about, in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, when people were designing what became the Western Civ um, model of not just history, but of scholarship, right. right? So if we talk about Western Civ, it starts often in Mesopotamia and Egypt, as you mentioned. Mesopotamia, by any modern definition, is not Western, right? I mean, the idea of Western is extremely problematic, and I don't want to write sort of say that that isn't. But we start with Mesopotamia and Egypt, and then that half of the Mediterranean, and in fact that half of Eurasia, drops off the map for the rest of Western Civ. Um, but not because there's no evidence. And, um, you know, I think Dr. Blatt in particular, through her uh, medieval travel courses, mm -hmm. has done a great job of bringing that literature back up, right? Marco Polo's travels, uh, Ibn Battuta's travels. He was, yeah, there's, there's tons of texts that have to do with people of color of, and people who are non-Christian and people who are not from France, Germany, England related to the Middle Ages. Um, and we need to start emphasizing those. But at the same time, um, the evidence is there. It's not even always accessible to us. Yeah. So this is also a, a situation where I'm teaching a class um, that Dr. Bigger has already referred to. It's my global Middle Ages class. It used to be a medieval travel Sorry. literature class, which was basically like medieval English travel literature. And I was like, this is too many white men all the time. It's I just can't deal. I've got to reconfigure this course. So I redesigned it kind of um, from the ground up. And... One of the things that I and taught it last spring, and I'm teaching it this spring, and in between the two semesters, I was thinking, I really would like to have some more voices from sub-Saharan Africa. And I spent hours, and I found a couple that were in, like, editions from the 19th century that had no contextual information, nothing that would help me place these in history. And there's a scholar whom I also found out about who's working on an anthology of, of medieval African literature. She's been working on it for about a decade, and it hasn't yet gotten published, which means that I don't even have access to that yet. So some of the reasons why this lack of access, the evidence is there, but the lack of the accessibility to that evidence is not there. And sometimes that's also been driven by how the academy has shaped its priorities, mm -hmm. who it hires, who is in the canon, and therefore who people get support to study and to teach and to research. Uh, and so this ends up becoming a kind of um, problematically self-reinforcing situation. 
that we've been very slowly trying to change. And, and it is changing, but it's still quite a slow process, unfortunately. So I was not able to include the texts that I was hoping to include because I couldn't even get access to them. They haven't even been published yet. They're, or they're, they're on the route towards publication, but they haven't yet been translated. And guess how many universities in the world teach medieval Ethiopian? <laughs> It can be really challenging, unfortunately, too, which is why it also makes a difference who enters um, graduate studies. And if that's something that's ever of interest to you, FIU is one of the best places to be right now, partly because we've got a program founded by the Mellon Foundation called the Hispanic Pathways Institute, which is about helping um, minority students enter the academy. Um, and, and kind of one of the consequences of that is a greater awareness of representation that all matters, not only in terms of who is being taught and who is teaching, but also in terms of who is pursuing what kind of studies and what enters the classroom and what kind of research takes place. And this gets back to the idea of the canon, too. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, you might not believe this, but one of the things that professors really take seriously when designing their courses is, can I get readable cheap editions of the books that students are going to be using, right? Because you guys don't want to pay $200 for one book that, you know, is a rare, old, out of print edition, right? So we're relying on publishers to have, you know, like Penguin Classics and things like that, books that you guys can buy cheaply that are in good modern English that are not super difficult to read so that you can get at the ideas. But if something was only translated out of Latin once in 1900, it's going to be really hard for you guys to read it. Um, and that's not to say you can't do it, but right, we need to balance these concerns. right? Or if a book is so rare or so old that it's super expensive, it might be something you decide against assigning for right out of concern for you guys. But that also limits what you have access to in an unfortunate way. Yeah. 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 I think for me, one of the things I sometimes regret is that I didn't go into grade school or high school teaching because I feel like, you know, I'm teaching people who in many ways have already succeeded. You've made it to college, right? Um, at the same time, you've got these ideas ingrained, right? So, you know, I think on the one hand, the outreach to those younger, mm -hmm. younger ages, right? Putting, you know, 
why is it that if there's a picture of a knight on a kid's classroom, it's a person who's white, right? Um, let's start changing those ideas. I hope that, you know, as my son gets older, I'm doing outreach to his schools. Maybe to go talk about the Middle Ages. Um, that's a drop in the bucket, though. That's not going to change, right? It's going to change the food involvement, I hope. Um, for me, though, um, one of the things I do is, and I think both of us, um, challenge people's preconceptions. Um, when I start my uh, medieval, one of my medieval classes, upper level, I ask people, I put them in groups, and I give them crowns, and I say, draw. Like, when I say the Middle Ages, what do you imagine? And then I do sort of a, a chart on the board, and we, we end up with more dragons than women, right? We end up with more... Um, you know, angels and peasants, right? Um, and people are aware that these are preconceived notions, which is saying, like, look, we have all these preconceived notions. Um, we have more horses than we have, you know, right, um, people who are not knights, right? Um, so just to say, look, like, see how ludicrous this is? Right? This is not a society, right? Somebody was doing agricultural labor, right? There was trade. There were people from all over traveling. And that can help break down some of those already established biases, right? But when we're working with college students, we're breaking down biases, right? Um, or, unfortunately, reinforcing them rather than creating them from scratch because you're right. Those have been, they've been there a while. Oh, Thank you guys. Thank you for coming and thank you for joining me.